Good morning to you all and welcome to our service today. May the Spirit of God who tabernacles with each and every believer open our hearts and minds to the understanding of His Word and grant us the assurance that our lives are joined with His at that final ingathering of the Bride of Christ. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun I will stand on every promise of your word Words of power strong to say That will never pass away I will stand on every promise of your word for your covenant is sure, and on this I am secure. I can stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation Testament reading this morning as we finish this series on Jesus, the feasts and me, is from Leviticus 23, from verses 33 through to verse 43. The Lord said to Moses, 
Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days present offerings made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies, for bringing offerings made to the Lord by fire, the burnt offerings and the grain offerings, sacrifice and drink offerings required for each day. These offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbath, and in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed, and all the free will offerings you give to the Lord. So, beginning on the fifteenth of... Th so, beginning with the fiftieth... So beginning with the fifteenth day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of rest, and the eighth day is also a day of rest. On the first day you are to take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds and leafy branches and poplars and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then we move over to Colossians in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through to 10. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. We give thanks to God for his word. As I mentioned, today we come to the end of our series, looking at the feasts of Israel as instituted by God, how they were or will be fulfilled by Jesus, and what it means to us. And I trust that you've been inspired and encouraged to deepen your walk with Jesus because of what you've seen him do for you through these feasts. But before we start, let's light our candles. We know that the first candle is for the Feast of Passover, where Jesus died on the cross for us. The second is for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where Jesus took the leaven upon himself, and took our leaven on him. Then we have the Feast of First Fruits, where Jesus is the first fruits of those who have died. And then we have the Feast of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came upon those disciples in that upper room. Then we have the fall feasts. We have the first being the Feast of Trumpets, and we know that that will be the trumpet sound that all the believers in Christ or the Bride of Christ will be gathered up to join him in the clouds. Then we have the, the Day of Atonement, the day when the Israelites, or the, the time period when the Israelites will realize that Jesus is the Messiah and they will be gathered with him. And now we come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Who of you enjoys camping? I know we do as a family. Admittedly, admittedly it's, it's been a while since we last went. But it's always exciting when we go off camping. You know, the, the trailer is packed, the car is packed, and, and off we go. And when we arrive at the campsite, we put everything out and we pitch camp. You know, camping life is different to the everyday. You, you rough it, you share ablutions with other people, and you make friends with those who are camping around you. Now, we are tent campers. 
And not to downplay those who have or prefer caravans, to us a caravan is just a home on wheels. We prefer camping to be different. But then you get the glamping, you know, the, the glamorous camping, where the, the only part you can say is actual camping, is, it's the canvas sides and the roof that, of the place where you're staying. And while we were still living in Johannesburg, there was a place that we loved to camp, a place called Bergheim. It's a small resort on the way to Rustenburg. We've been camping there in the same spot for over 10 years. It's a lovely, tranquil place, just the place to go to rest and revive. But why am I talking about camping? Well, in the Old Testament, our reading from Leviticus 23, we see, see the Lord God giving instruction to Moses that the people of Israel were to, in, in verse 42, to live in booths for seven days. And why were they to do that? Well, verse 43 tells us why. So that your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. But what is a booth? Well, it's a bit like a gazebo in, in which you live. It's made of palm fronds and, and branches. And it was to remind the people of Israel that they lived in portable shelters as they moved around in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And that they were only pilgrims passing through this life and that God had a greater rest for them in the future when he would come and live among them permanently. And this is what the writer of Hebrews was referring to in, when he wrote, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as, in, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with, without foundations, whose architect and builder is God. But what do camping and booths and portable shelters have to do with the Feast of Tabernacles? You know, isn't the, the tabernacle the place where God dwelt amongst the Israelites while in the wilderness and in the promised land before the temple was built? Yes, it is. But, but to tabernacle means to dwell. And the tabernacle was the place where God dwelt. And the Feast of Tabernacles was the time when the Israelites themselves dwelt in booths. And so another name for this feast could, is very well much the, the Feast of Booths. And this feast held two aspects. It was a reminder to the people of Israel of the 40 years of wandering that was brought about by unbelief and disobedience. But God was there in their midst providing for their every need and eventually bringing them into the land of rest that he had promised them. But there's another angle to this feast and it has to do with the, with the harvest. Unlike with the barley and the wheat harvest of the spring feasts, this feast has to do with the final ingathering of all the harvests. And so another name for this feast is the Feast of Ingathering. And this was a time of great rejoicing in the harvest that God Almighty had blessed the people with over the past year. And it was the signal that they could now rest from their harvest labors. It was a time of great rejoicing. And it was said that if you hadn't been to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, you didn't know what rejoicing meant. So what did this feast entail? Well, God gives Moses instructions for this feast in Leviticus 23, which we read. And then uh, the instructions are from verse 33 to 36. And then from verse 39, he gives a bit more detail. But if you really want in-depth instructions, then you need to head over to Numbers chapter 29, from verses 12 to 39. But we're not going to read that now. But here in Numbers 29, we read of what offerings and sacrifices were to be made on each of the seven days and the eighth day. And according to the scriptures, there were three main activities that were related to, this, to the celebration of this feast. The first was that the people were to live in temporary shelters or booths during the feast in order to remember the time when God had brought them out of Egypt and had provided for them in the wilderness. The, the second aspect of the feast is that the people were to bring specific fruits and tree branches which were waved before the Lord at the appropriate time. 
And then there were also specific sacrifices that were to be offered on each day of the feast, as well as on that eighth day following the feast. The last of the fall feasts, this Feast of Tabernacles, was to be held on 15 Tishri, the date. And whenever it was, that day, that first day of the feast, was to be a sacred assembly, a special Sabbath, and no regular work was to be done, as with all the special Sabbaths, as we've seen. And as I've mentioned, for seven days they were to present offerings made to the Lord by fire. And then, on the day after the feast, that's the eighth day, they were to hold another sacred assembly, a special Sabbath, and again an offering made to the Lord by fire. And this eighth day was the closing assembly for the Feast of Tabernacles. And this Feast of Tabernacles is the seventh feast instituted by God that completed the religious season. And there's something about the number seven. Seven is the Almighty God's number, and it refers to His perfection and His completion. This is the seventh feast, the last instituted by God. It's held in the seventh month, and it's held over seven days. See, the Feast of Tabernacles shows the completed or finished work of God, both in this present age and also in the lives of the individual believers. The four spring feasts were fulfilled by Jesus at his first coming. The Feast of Passover was fulfilled by Jesus' sacrificial death. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was fulfilled by his burial. And the Feast of First Fruits was fulfilled by his resurrection. And the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, was fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then there is a four-month break until the fall feast season, a gap which represents the church age, that the age in which we are now living. And it's during this time that God is bringing salvation to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous so that they can eventually be saved, as Paul tells us in his letter to the church in Rome. We saw that the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled when the trumpet is sounded and Jesus comes to collect his bride and we all meet him in the sky. And then last week we saw that the Day of Atonement would be fulfilled when Israel will finally understand that Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah and that they will mourn over their role in his death and be saved through faith in him. But how does Jesus fit into the Feast of Tabernacles? Quite simply. Jesus Christ is the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God. And we read in John chapter 1 verse 14 and as we read in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 that in Jesus dwells the fullness of God in bodily form. And then in verse 10 of Colossians chapter 2 it says that we have been given the fullness in Christ which is what Jesus himself says is recorded in Luke chapter 17 verse 21 that God dwells in our midst through his Son, Jesus Christ, in us. And it's in John chapter 1 verse 14 that also points to Jesus coming to tabernacle among his people in that first coming. He came to dwell, to teach, and to heal, to bring peace, and to bring rest. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 to 30, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we know that there are, are many Old Testament prophecies that point to Jesus, but one in particular that relates to the Feast of Tabernacles is found in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. And it reads this, that in that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. Jesus came to heal the sick, and to bind up the brokenhearted, and that is what Amos is referring to. See, many Christians seek God's rest by working for Him or trying to get something from Him. But that's not what God's rest is all about. Our rest is in God through our relationship with Jesus. Jesus doesn't give us life. 
He is our life. And Jesus doesn't give us health. He is our health. And Jesus doesn't give us the fruit and the gifts of his spirit because he is the fruit and gifts of his spirit. These are the manifestations of his life in us. You want to enter his rest? Well, then seek him and not the things from him. As Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He didn't say, ask me for rest, but come to me and I will give you the rest. But how then does the Feast of Tabernacles point to the future, the future events? Well, the name Feast of Ingathering gives us a clue. See, with the Feast of Trumpets, the Bride of Christ is called to be with him. With the Day of Atonement, the nation of Israel are given the opportunity to come to Jesus and accept him as their Messiah. And the Feast of Ingathering is the reign of God's kingdom on earth when all his children are gathered to one place and he dwells with them. Where all believers become one new man, as Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. The following the thousand years where the martyrs will reign with Christ, the final judgment will take place, and then the glorious fulfillment is described by John in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 7, where God gathers his people in the new Jerusalem, and in the person of Jesus Christ, tabernacles with them for all of eternity. I want to read this, that passage to you. Revelation chapter 21, from verse 2 to 7. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. As with the other six feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, and Atonement, this Feast of Tabernacles not only points to Jesus, but also to the condition of our hearts, those who are righteous and those who are not. Because in the end, it is only the righteous who will experience the benefits of life in Christ. Do you have the assurance that Jesus tabernacles with you here and now? Do you have the assurance that you will be part of that final ingathering to live with him in his rest for all of eternity? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 11 says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did to them. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they will have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. It was God's desire to lead the Hebrews into their promised land of rest. And it's his desire that all would enter his rest in our souls now. We must accept Jesus as our Passover lamb who takes away our sins. We must believe that Jesus became leaven or sin in our place and believe that he is the first fruits of the resurrection. And that one day we will be resurrected to eternal life with him. We must receive the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to walk the Christian life. If we do, then we know that when the trumpet sounds, we, as the bride of Christ, will meet him in the air. And then for all of eternity, he will tabernacle with us in the new Jerusalem. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. 
as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And as we come to the table today, don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation, because tomorrow may be too late. Let's pray. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the picture that we have in your word of these feasts and how they are pictures of Christ, your Son. Father, as we've looked at this feast today, this feast of, of ingathering, this feast of tabernacles, Father, we want the assurance that we will be part of that ingathering, that you will tabernacle with us. So Jesus, we accept you as our Passover lamb who takes away our sins. We believe that Jesus, you became sin. You became that leaven in our place. And we believe that you are the first fruits of the resurrection. And that one day we will be resurrected to eternal life with you. And Holy Spirit, come and fill us and give us the power to walk the Christian life. Because Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we want to know that when that trumpet sounds, we will be part of the bride of Christ who will meet Jesus in the air, and then for all of eternity will we'll tabernacle with you in the new Jerusalem. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do for us, for what you've done for us, and what you will do for us. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. And thank you for life everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to the table this morning, we are reminded again of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And as we come to share in the body and the blood of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that he was our Passover lamb, that he took our leaven and that he rose as the first fruits and sent his Holy Spirit. And that we look forward to the day that the trumpet sounds and we meet him in the air and the final ingathering where, we will tabernacle, where he will tabernacle with us for all of eternity. And so let us partake of this body and blood with thankfulness and joy for what he has done and will do for us. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for us. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for us. We thank you, Father, for the gift of this meal, that, th that through it we are united to you through what your Son did on our behalf. Thank you that because of his death and resurrection, we can have forgiveness of our sins and life everlasting. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and
freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now until that day when the trumpet sounds and we meet our Savior in the sky. Amen. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep, able to keep us from falling, and present his faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior.